So as a libertarian, the thing I'm excited about right now is uh, Congressman Thomas Massey's Prime Act. If you've not heard of the Prime Act, let me give you a little bit of a background. Right now, there are three kind of food safety options in the amenable meats. So we're talking about beef, pork, lamb, chicken, uh, turkey. An umbrella of food safety regulations that determine what you can and cannot sell, who you can sell it to, and those sorts of things. One is federal inspection. So this is a federal government agent under the Federal Safety Inspection Service, FSIS, who comes, who's physically present, and looks and pokes and sniffs at every carcass to determine, you know, is this okay to, to eat? Safe for human consumption, I think is the word. And then you have state inspection. Now, about half the states don't even have a state inspection program anymore. They, they just have let it all be the federal. But about half the states have a state inspection program. Virginia does. And the state inspection is, is equal to the federal. The only difference is that typically the state inspectors are just a little easier to work with. It's less centralized government. You know, it's, it's closer, closer to the people. But the state inspection allows you to sell uh, within the state. Federal allows you to sell anywhere in the world. State only allows you to sell within the state. And then there's custom. So custom is when you take your animal to the slaughterhouse, they process it for you, and the packages come back and they're all stamped not for sale. Not What, what that means is you can give that meat away. You can't sell a T-bone steak to a neighbor that says, hey, you know, I'd like to get one of those steaks from you. Uh, would you sell it to me? Well, no, I can't sell it because it wasn't under inspection. The phrase that's used in custom slaughter and it, why it doesn't have to be inspected is because it's considered your animal. The language in the law is an animal of your raising. Oh boy, lawyers have fun with words like this. Of your, what does of your raising mean? And so, ever since this was put in back in the, you know, uh, 40s, you can't ask the, slaughter, the, the guy that owns the little community slaughterhouse to be the policeman to determine, well, did you raise this animal or did somebody else raise this? It's too complicated, okay? What they decided was, as long as the animal came in with the owner's name on it, they wouldn't question that that person, it was of their race. In other words, they bought it live. They, they made an arrangement while the animal was live. There's no regulations about selling a live animal. Anyone can sell a live animal with no inspection, no regulations whatsoever. I can sell you a cow, I can sell you a chicken, sell you a pig. I don't have to file any paperwork. There's no licenses, no regulations, okay? But as soon as that animal is dead, then all these regulations kick in. If I take an animal in and I'm selling it to you know, um, Mike Smith, I can take that animal in uh, and put, you know, um, animal, you know, ear tag number seven is owned by Mike Smith and it's considered an animal of his raising, okay? The beauty of this is that it allowed farmers to sell animals pre-death to, to, to divvy them up. And it doesn't have to be a whole animal. It can be uh, down to a quarter of an animal, even an eighth of an animal. Uh, so you can have ear tag number seven uh, is owned by Mike Smith, Jane, you know, Jane Austen, <laughs> Philip, whatever. You can have all these names written and, and, and that works. The regulators have been uh, uh, fairly, you know, fairly gentle on that, on that aspect as farmers have pushed the of your own raising loophole for custom. Well, why would a person want custom? Why would they want inspection? Well, because custom is way, way cheaper because you don't have the paperwork. You don't have to have a hazardous analysis critical control point. I co-own a federal inspected slaughterhouse, a little community slaughterhouse here not far away uh, that we use. Basically, the, the paperwork to have a federal inspected facility adds it doubles the capital cost of operating the facility. So that means that the cost of processing, which is 
not cheap. A federal inspected animal at a community uh, abattoir like this, uh, that's a pretty French name for slaughterhouse, will generally run somewhere between $500 and $800 per animal, okay? Well, if you can cut that by 30%, say, by going to custom, you've just cut a couple hundred dollars off of the processing cost, which then you can pass on to your customer. So that your ground beef, instead of being $8 a pound, can be, you know, $7.20 or $7. So, so it's a costing thing. The thing to realize is that thousands of farmers like us for decades have used this loophole to sell an animal live to somebody who's never seen that animal, but they know they want an animal from us. So we go to the abattoir with their name on that animal or a portion of that animal. They take that meat home, pay us, and it's perfectly legal to do because their name was on it when it went in initially. That's the way things have been. Well, what's happened is that as new rules and regulations have come about, and frankly, as consumers have moved away from volume purchasing, a lot of people don't want a volume of beef. In other words, the regulations only allow you to do custom. You can't sell one T-bone steak. You have to sell at least an eighth and generally a quarter of that animal. Well, a quarter of a steer, you know, might be $800. A lot of people either don't have $800 or they don't have enough freezer capacity to, to handle that much meat at one time. They can't opt in to this lower cost, more community accessible supply because they either don't have the freezer capacity or the money at the time or both. And so they end up having to buy by the piece, by the cut, under inspection and pay a lot more for that which of course is costly to them and further exacerbates the fact they don't have the money, they don't have the space. How do you get ahead you know, when you can't participate in the, the, the less costly template, which is you know, custom? Sorry, you know, sorry ma'am, uh, you can't have uh, this cheaper meat because you don't have $800 on your pocket and you don't have a freezer. What Congressman Thomas Massey has presented in the Prime Act is to allow custom processed beef to be sold by the cut. Look, our customers, they don't see the cows. They're not checking the meat. They're not looking at it. They trust us and they're buying it sight unseen because they trust us and they trust the abattoir. They trust us to pick an abattoir that's okay. And we trust our abattoir operator. If the meat's bad, throw it out, okay? All that is part of this very localized, highly relational transaction. So what Thomas Massey is saying is, let's open up custom, not across state lines, but within a state, to be sold by the cut. Nobody's inspecting it anyway. The customer isn't seeing it anyway. And so let's quit the charade. Let's quit the requirement of telling the customer you have to buy a quarter. You have to, you have to spend $800 to $1,000. You have to have a freezer. Instead of requiring that of the customer, let's just let anyone who wants to participate in this lower cost, locally accessible product to be able to participate in it. All the safeguards within the custom system are still there. These custom slaughterhouses still are in, they are overall inspected by state inspectors who inspect, you know, basically the facility. You know, they, they look around uh, and make sure there's, you know, there's not a bunch of, you know, junk on the floor, that sort of thing. But each carcass, each animal, there's not a physical presence of an inspector on the floor when those animals are slaughtered are slaughtered, but because the system is, is so much more highly relational and it's much more local and that whole chain of custody is shorter and more compact, that creates inherent safeguards that the federal inspection does on very, very large plants or plant selling, you know, to Sri Lanka and Bangladesh or, or you know, into wherever. And so the Prime Act would free up farmers and abattoirs to be able to sell custom processed meat to customers and customers would then be freed up 
to be able to enjoy by the piece what is only enjoyed right now by people who have a big pocket full of money and a freezer to put it in. And suddenly that would open up transactional marketplace options, both for farmers, for abattoirs, and for local consumers, save them a lot of money, offer markets for farmers, offer opportunity to abattoirs, and allow relocalization of the food system. Massey says that he knows of at least a thousand custom slaughterhouses who have been run out of business by onerous government regulations and the inability to participate in the marketplace who would come back in in a week or two, who would come back into the system and offer more options for consumers and farmers in the local food space if the Prime Act were passed and they could now participate in the marketplace. As a libertarian, I love every option for solutions that are not asking for more government involvement, but less government involvement. Generally, in my opinion, every time the government gets involved in something, it louses it up. If we want real solutions, the real solutions are giving us freedom and liberty to exercise our own, as Adam Smith said, invisible hand of the marketplace and opt for what we want for what works for us. That's the ultimate freedom of choice. And the Prime Act is right now the tip of the, it's incremental. I mean, I'd like to go way farther than the Prime Act. There are sponsors and uh, bless his heart, you know, Congressman Thomas Massey has been working on this for several years. COVID, COVID brought the fragility of the centralized uh, system. You know, everybody found out how fragile the, um, you know, the centralized food system was. And so uh, decentralization is a big deal. I'll part with this question. It's a rhetorical question, it's an easy answer. Do you think that the culture, that the food system would have been able to respond faster in the spring of 2020 when the store shelves were empty, would have been able to respond faster if our food funnel came not from 300 mega processing facilities, but from 30,000 neighborhood friendly localized processing facilities? which would have been able to adapt faster to COVID and to the, to the uh, spring of 2020? I think the answer is obvious. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to say, wow, if we had had a decentralized system with a lot more options, the adaptation would have been a lot faster. And so from a food opportunity, a food security, and an ultimate food stability standpoint, the Prime Act is a perfect libertarian answer to the problems that we have in our current food system.